Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Mandek, a member of the Refresh Collective. It is my pleasure to introduce today's panel on world building. We'll start with presentations from each of our three panelists. Afterwards, we'll hold a conversation between ourselves, and then we'll end with a Q&A from the audience. As a bit of the background, I want to invoke Edouard Glissant. As he so urgently stated in Poetics of Relation, we demand the right to opacity. That is to say, instead of the scientific essentialisms that assign a final signified, in the spirit of Glissant's opacity, we move towards a playful curiosity and inquiry that leaves room for questions without answers, that does not totalize another via the violence of fact. It is in this spirit of curiosity that we hope to trouble the settler ontologies that govern scientific inquiry and instead think of strategies that repurpose these technologies towards a liberatory world-building politic. Existing outside of and in excess of the human category necessitates the exploration of a science oriented towards something other than what currently is. In this way, we can productively fail at being governable subjects. So when discussing world building, we take our cues from Octavia Butler on living through the end of the world and making life out of intense environmental, social, and political upheaval of land and communities. We also understand that utopic impulses, a huge premise for today's conference, may not be realized within our lifetimes and are perpetually delayed. A part of the project of world, world building then is to engage a science that offers us strategies and tactics for living through the here and now, some of which we hope to discuss with you today. Our panelists are Shawnee Michael Lane Holloway a new media artist who uses sound, video, and performance to shape the rhetorics of technology and sexuality into tools for exposing structures of power. She has spoken and exhibited work internationally in spaces like the New Museum, Sorbus Galleria, the Kitchen, Institute of Contemporary Arts, and the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. Currently, she teaches in the New Arts Journalism Department at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Also joining us is Rashida Phillips, the managing attorney of Landlord Tenant Housing Unit at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. She is a writer, artist, and cultural producer. Rashida is the founder of Afrofuturist Affair and Black Quantum Futurism Collective and a founding member of Metropolarity Queer Sci-Fi Collective. She is a self-published speculative fiction author of multiple books. She is also the co-creator of the award-winning Community Future Labs project, a socially engaged art project utilizing themes of com communal temporality, futurism, and preservation of memory and history in an area undergoing redevelopment, gentrification, and mass displacement. We're also joined by Alexander Wahelier, who is a scholar and teacher of black literature and culture, critical theory, social technologies, and popular culture. He teaches in the Department of African American Studies at Northwestern University. He is the author of Phonographies, Groove and Sonic, Grooves and Sonic Afro-Modernity, and Habeas Viscus, Racializing Assemblages, Biopolitics, and Black Feminist Theories of the Human. Currently, he is working on Phenin, RMB's Technologies of Humanity, which offers a critical history of the intimate relationship between R&B music and technology since the late 1970s. We'll get started now with our first panelist, Shawnee Michael Lane Holloway. This piece uh, is just a short piece I wrote called On Liberation, uh, Fantastic Mechanisms. One, I seek through pain to achieve a higher level of consciousness, which is a pleasure beyond the physical nature of mere pain. 
Though I inflict pain on others, I assist in their liberation as I am also liberated. My connection with my partner under such circumstances is deeper and more totally real than any other experience two people can share. This quote and the two following in a bit are from Reflections on Sadomasochism and Race by the Real Don Perry. Black Leather and Color is the publication, volume one, number three, fall 1994. Black, lesbian, femme, rope bottom, pup for non-binary, black woman, lesbian, woman of color, 26, New York City. LF, other weird and busy girls to walk me, likes, consent to your dirty underwear, restrictions, will bite at time wasters and scaredy cats, needs regular discipline and rigorous training, play only. Rope top BW for rope top or rope bottom BW serious only 35 New York City. What we're not going to do is front, looking for a series of conversations that don't lead to dates or drinks, seeking sub for discipline and denial, must love order, must text back, no sex, not ever. It's a match. Two. Think of it as a labor which gives birth to a joint consciousness and connects two lives at the intersection of their spirits. This is a realness of feeling and emotion that approaches true ecstasy. This is the aim of SM, to enable mere mortal flesh to touch God, capital G. To create an authenticity of feeling and emotion that allows one to feel the living spirit, capital S, which resides in all things. The instruments of torture used to achieve this state are merely tools of a higher master, the real Don Perry. What aspect of fantasy isn't a technology? In celebration of a blind faith in this inexplicable human desire to discover utopic connective methodologies, fantasy allows us to access a poetic in-between, a worship-like manifestation of a self-sensing co-presence, unique to an individual who, with themselves in solitude or tandem, experience a range of real-time emotions triggered by voluntary ritual performance or reading. These rituals then grant the individual agency to feel a deep sense of proximity between body and spirit, making way for transformation and reflection with an otherworldly co-presence beneath them. The activation of this routine highlights the relationships between the emotional and sensing, uniting it with its physical container beyond the reach of any retelling. The feeling connection and its relationship with itself must be allowed to play and stretch within its container to be celebrated in the body, to evolve through its unique performativity, to be given access, re-liberation, to the space of a genuine manufactured euphoria. This is where it connects with its intellectual counterparts, the privilege of actively knowing, knowing. It must be worked for. Once unlocked, it erects a layer of new privacies, freedoms, knowledges, and pleasures, dangers, and dogmas to be meticulously organized. The continued harnessing of that access comes through the rigorous rearranging of resources like time or heart space, and encourages a creativity through the call for the necessity to manufacture situations that maximize the occurrence of growth through a structured recreation. This fantastic mechanism allows us to live in the folds of shared reality nestled in private spaces sequestered for the control over the automation of our euphoria. Here we find agency over self through interiority, through inquiry, and through recre recreation. Uh, users of this technology reject definitive systems of pleasure, healing, time, embodiments. Especially important for the black, queer, and disabled identified fantasy, re read worship, provides a route towards privacies and agencies that resist, resist taxonomy historically organized by Anglo-centric, educational, medical, read carceral cultures, making room for the construction of interdependent ecologies that are better able to support our needs. Three. We are truly prisoners of the flesh, and in liberating ourselves of this imprisonment, we find ourselves at one, capital O, with the universe. Yet permanently leaving this earthly coil is not realistic. One path can achieve a similar state 
or one can achieve a similar state of grace via certain paths under the tutelage of a knowledgeable master and realize the closest thing to nirvana that mere mortals will ever achieve. These are not new fetishes somehow learned from the white man. These practices have nothing to do with vestigial slave mentalities or self, low self-esteem. If today I am a dominant top, it is because at one point in the past I learned what it is like to be a bottom, and now I can pass on the lessons on life and strength of character, principles, more moral values and sensitivity which define a whole noble lineage of those that began before my time and will end long after theirs. I was greeted first by the altars in her house, scattered, taking up the space in all its corners. Bags of candy, booze, beads, and candles lined each arrangement, placed with care along the sta alongside stacks of paper with words sprawled across them in languages I didn't recognize. You can't be naked in front of that one, she said as she touched my arm with one hand, making sure I heard her the first time. She let go, replacing my arm and her hands with the handles of my bags and began the four-foot walk through the kitchen into the living area and disappeared. I caught my breath, struggling to take my shoes off. We'll do it in here. Can I sit down, I yelled. No. I waited there for a moment, looking, what it, wondering what it would be like to cross over in a home where crossing over had clearly so many different meanings. How much openness was I allowed, willing to allow in a space with such unfamiliar worship before me? I joined her in the next room, hanging on the walls were ropes and knives and artworks and calendars. Don't sit anywhere, she repeated. Don't talk. Don't screw with your underwear. Take everything else off and leave it on the floor next to you. I dropped my purse first. We really were here to do only what we had agreed on now that all the words were out of the way. I watched her silently from my place to the left of her bed as she shuffled around, covering some of the other altars with blankets. Finished, she grabbed the first rope off the wall and turned toward me. Pulling one string, the bundle collapsed, its length falling to the floor with a dull, dry thud. She stood directly in front of me, watching. What else do you need to be ready, she asked. I told her I was cold and then stumbled over the word water. Her hand grabbed the back of my neck and led me to our starting position, leaving the unbound hemp rope heavy on my neck. Down, girl, stay. From my position on my knees, I waited for her to return, wondering if this work would feel any different under a roof where these unfamiliar gods lived. I had never met one. Could they see us? I closed my eyes and prepared to journey into a divine space of my own amidst the overwhelming evidence of the others. Slipping off into subspace, I lost my sense of being a biped and saw my own light. We'll now hear from Rashida Phillips. Okay, sorry, my slides are out of order, so I'm just going to talk. Um, it may be nonlinear, but that's perfectly fine. Um, so my name is Rashida Phillips. I, um, as was said in my bio, um, am from Philadelphia. And back in 2011, I started a organization called the Afrofuturist Affair, um, primarily as a way to um, think about, so when I encountered Afrofuturism, it was very much an academic term, one that lived on the internet. Um, but as a attorney um, who serves low income people in, in the community, I was, my concern became about how does Afrofuturism um, become accessible to people who have been told or provided the message that they don't get to make it into the future. And so for me, it was very much about how do we take very seriously the notion that the Afro prefix on futurism actually modifies the future. Um, and so I began to think about um, who does the future not include or include when we, when we even say the word future, um, and, and how is the future flattened and made objective? 
um, is the future evenly accessible to everyone? And how do factors like race, gender, income shift the means of access to the future? So a lot of my projects became about exploring that idea and exploring the ways that linear time has been um, made to become an oppressive force, um, particularly in black communities. Sorry, yeah, it's just missing some slides, but that's okay. Um, and often, you know, when we, when we think about oppression and, and all of these kinds of things, we're thinking about spatiality and we're thinking about how space is used to oppress people, but rarely are we, we kind of talking about how time and temporality is used to oppress. Um, and so mechanical clock time, um, and the slide I was going to show shows a kind of um, parallel between um, tools um, used um, against enslaved people and mechanical clock parts. And, and just thinking about how, again, um, mechanical clock time has been used to oppress um, people since time immemorial. And so when you look at kind of how um, colonizers and um, folks went over to Africa, um, to the continent, the first thing that they said is that these people are timeless. They exist outside of time, um, and that is something that makes them uncivilized. And so because they're, they're not on linear time, and, and being um, in linear time is, is next to godliness because God is the ultimate clock maker and ultimate um, uh, timekeeper. And, and um, so, so time was seen as, as a civilizing factor, and, and the fact that um, the observations about um, people on the continent were that they were outside of mechanical time because they had different means and ways of observing and, and utilizing time um, that, again, they were seen as uncivilized. And so this, um, this, this was then, you know, when, when we were brought over, when our ancestors were brought over to America and, and spread out across the, the world, um, they um, a kind of linear clock time was indoctrinated. And again, you can kind of look at um, the plantation and to think about how um, the structure of time as a linear causal past, present, future thing was literally beaten into slaves in, in very particular ways. Um, and, you know, tying tie, time into labor, tying time into all, all of these kinds of things. Um, and so um, my work explores that. My work explores um, the meaning of the future. Um, the history of the future, the history of time, and mechanical linear clock time, and again, how that's been used um, and continues to be used um, up into the present. Um, so black quantum futurism um, theory and practice um, derived out of that and derived out of, and prior to me even starting the Afrofuturist Affair, I've always been a, a science fiction fan and, and writer, and, and my particular obsession is around time travel. Um, so again, it was really key for me to think about how African traditions and, and Afro-diasporan traditions modify time, um, and or linear clock time at least, or, or um, embody alternative um, ways of of observing and experiencing time, and how that parallels in many ways to um, what we are now learning about quantum physics and about science. And, and of course, you know, people always question what that means, but um, it's, it's parallels. It's, it's not one for one correspondence, but it's parallels. And so when you look at the things like the, the principles of quantum physics that allow time to move backwards and forwards, um, you know, notions like retrocausality or um, things like. Um, um, uh, the kind of principles that allow um, one particle to be changed and a particle across the world entanglement to be changed simultaneously. So just the ways that it deals with time has a lot of parallels to the ways that um, African uh, ancient diasporan traditions of time and space and rhythm and, and all these kinds of things and, and cyclical nature of time and thinking about how time is layered because our ancestors are always with us. They don't die, they're, they're just on another kind of temporal plane. Um, so my work became really interested in that and, and um, I started to think about the question of um, how we begin to build these like kind of time machines in the future um, to, into the Afro future. Um, and the Afro future, again, not being something that's spatially a, before us, and because when we think about ourselves on the progress arrow of time that's moving straight forward into the future, black folks are always gonna be behind on that arrow of time. So how do we modify that arrow? How do we break that arrow? Um, so black quantum futurism um, thinks about how do we reappropriate clocks and maps to um, kind of deconstruct these hegemonic Western space times and dismantle the master's clock and the master's clockwork universe. Um, so our practice includes a lot of mapping, um, and currently I'm working on a project called Black Woman Temporal Portal um, that is um, a 
website, Black Woman, W-O-M-X-N, temporal, that's um, a temporal toolkit to think about, again, the unique ways that black women um, and, and uh, femmes experience time um, and girls. Um, the, the sort of intersectional nature of, of the ways that we experience time that is different than others. So um, doing things like mapping, alternative mapping, um, thinking about things like grandmother paradoxes instead of grandfather paradoxes, which is the common time travel trope, and thinking about how um, Octavia Butler's novel, for example, Kindred, um, uses a kind of grandmother paradox to think about travel through time that is nonlinear. Um, and thinking about, um, yeah, and so the Black Woman Temporal Portal is actually going to become a physical portal that um, one can you go into and, and again have a sort of temporal, temporary kind of safe space for black women, femmes, and girls to be able to um, respect and, and engage with their own temporalities outside of the um, kind of linear timescapes. Um, some of my other projects include um, the Community Futures Lab, which um, is a project that is based in an uh, area of North Philly that's undergoing rapid gentrification um, and destruction, basically, in, in, in a word, um, where the government has come in and taken over 1,300 properties through a process called eminent domain um, and has destroyed um, the low-income housing in that area and then displaced about 500 families. And so as part of that project, um, I documented the um, redevelopment that was happening and then engaged in, we opened up a um, storefront for a year and engaged in what we called oral futures interviews with people to not only be able to recover the past and recover the memory of that community um, and to think about how they built time together and how they survived through time and through the kind of um, disinvestment and oppression that occurred in that community um, and how that narrative has become disconnected to what's happening in the present. Um, and so when you, when you look at kind of the justifications for coming in and taking this community and basically erasing it, um, it's, it's, it's all the language is very future oriented. It's not space oriented. And when we go back and look at like Thomas Jefferson for example, and, and you know, we think about things like manifest destiny and exploring out into the, uh, expanding out into the West, but they're talking about expanding into time, into the future, into permanently being able to um, carry the kind of regime and the legacy into the long-term future. And so when we ignore that, we ignore kind of a, a very huge um, aspect of this. And so in, in terms of justifying why they were taking this community, it was this future-oriented language. And so um, I began to think about, again, in my work as an attorney, how time and temporality um, within legal systems, like the ones that allow you to take property by eminent domain and give people three months notice, but then it takes them 10 years to challenge um, the eminent domain, or the kind of eviction process that gets people evicted within 21 days if you're 10 minutes late to court. So thinking about those different temporal systems and how, again, they work to oppress low-income, black, um, typically poor people, um, and, and, um, and for the Community Futures Lab, thinking again about how we uncover the memory of that community, um, but also manifest into the future what people want to see. And so um, black quantum futurism, again, is, is not saying that you know we're, we're just going to be able to return to an Afro-diasporan way of observing time. And you know we don't we don't think that that's quite possible in that particular way. We have to live in linear time. I have to be a, a mother and go to work, and so I have to live in linear time. But there is a way to balance that, and, and one is to begin to think about alternative temporalities. Think about how time is used as a measure to oppress. Think about how time is punishment. Um, t doing time in prison, time is money. All of these these kinds of things that are ingrained in us that we don't question because we we take time to be objective and we take the future to be objective, um, and so the. Black Women Temporal Project, real quick, is just, again, me challenging this statement, something I don't like, which is the future is feminine. It very much forecloses the possibility, one, that the future is plural and not objective, and that we don't all make it into the same future. Two, feminism has not been kind to black women and to black trans women. And so um, for me, the, the futures are black quantum womanist as opposed to the future is feminine. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Alexander Wahelier. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. The recent prominence of Black Lives Matter and the broader groundswell of the movement for black lives has once again put pressure on black art and black music to become more politicized 
in order to address the continued disregard of black life by state and non-state non institutions in the US and in many other parts of the world. Not surprisingly, this politicization has most often taken the path of highlighting how the violence of white supremacy affects cisgendered and heterosexual black male persons in the public sphere. Given that R&B music tends to focus on black everyday livingness, interiority, and interpersonal relationships from female slash femme perspectives, the genre um, um, shed spotlights on the minor, quote unquote, aspects of the genocidal conditions that mark the continued existence of black life in the Western world. Thus for me, rather than hearing contemporary R&B music as a retreat from the political, um, I investigate how um, it centers black femme defined interpersonal intimacy, interiority, and um, care. And let me see if this works. These two statements by um, Ethiopian American um, um, queer um, R&B singer Kalela on the eve of her release of her debut album highlight the um, complicated status of R&B music as a sign for blackness, particularly um, politicized blackness, especially for black femme performers. Um, given that um, um, pro-black politics um, is defined in such narrow terms and is usually only thought to reside, um, reside in the lyrics but not the sounds of the actual um, music. So in contradistinction, my questions, how does the sound of R&B create different modalities of the political if, as Kalela herself states, it's silly to even think that there's only one way we can express our identity? And of course, she also brings to the fore um, the many ways that black life is always already um, 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 political. And so um, my interest is in how the sounds and the vocal manipulations of contemporary R&B sound what we might term um, black femme technologies of opacity that function as shelters and healing spaces um, from anti-blackness. Um, 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 and, and this just as a little bit of a background in terms of how R&B music tends to be uh, critically treated by um, 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 Daph Daphne Brooks. And what is important here in this particular, um, um, particular quote for me is that, um, as, as Brooks shows, that since the, um, 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 the 1980s and the advent of hip hop, there's been a fairly conscious and consistent way in which R&B has become depoliticized in terms of how it is criticized, critiqued, um, analyzed, et cetera, and um, 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 so on. Um, so it's not that the genre itself has become apolitical, but that um, its focus on black femme, black women's desire um, since the 1980s is what has become depoliticized. Um, 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 and what I'm particularly interested in is the effective labor carried out by the black femme um, um, singing voice as a um, productive space for thinking about the past, present, and um, 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 future of um, black feminists. Um, and I take my definition of black femme from um, black queer equal feminist scholar Chelsea Frazier. Um, and this is a very long quote. I'm not going to go into it. I'm happy to talk about it. And Chelsea is also in the audience, so you can also ask her during questions and answers. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in is in this definition um, that Fraser brings to the fore is the, um, the intricacies of a broader range of um, um, feminine subjectivities as they intersect with a number of different embodiments and, um, 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 and um, um, identities. And um, to add to this, um, following Fraser and um, others, I'm thinking about black feminists as a critical approach in line with Kara Keeling's statement here that black femme offers a glimpse into a range of mechanisms whereby transformations within an alternative, alternatives to existing organizations of life might, um, might be um, um, affected. And that the black femme exists um, as a figure on the edge of the visible and the invisible, serving as a portal through which present impossibilities might appear. And I'm thinking 
just in terms of what you were saying, Rashida, that the present impossibilities, of course, also open up, um, if we don't think about time as something linear, into all these other um, 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 temporalities. Um, so in that threshold um, between audibility, inaudibility, perceptibility, and imperceptibility, future, past, pre-refiguring, um, where they all reverberate against um, one another, um, a black femme analytic unlocks um, of the portal to a vestibular geography of different modalities of beautiful black queer livingness in the present and its various um, 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 futures. And to come back to R&B music, um, I'm gonna make a very long story very, very short. Um, just to give you one example, um, so that for instance, Janet Jackson's 1997 um, 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 album Velvet Rope, which very much serves as a template for a number of um, um, particularly black femme contemporary R&B performers, is an album by a um, um, superstar at that point that deals with queerness, interiority, depression, sexual abuse, trauma, bondage, vulnerability, and the um, um, AIDS um, 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 crisis. And um, one of the things that that album also highlights is a shift in R&B um, away from a particular black church derived way of singing being the dominant feature of the genre to these more interior forms of layering voices and um, 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 and um, 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 singing, and I'm happy to talk about that um, later. So um, this, ex this shift from externalized grandeur of melisma to the overlapping um, concentric circles of harmonic folds suggest um, black femme forms of effective labor um, that turn inward rather than outward and perform interiority. R&B becomes a technology of black femme opacity by undertaking the labor of sounding a white variety of interiorities and intimacies that are necessary for the existence of the properly political quote unquote and future opacities, um, future opacities. And just to give you one example um, um, of this, um, <clears throat> Somali Canadian singer Aman Nur's um, 2017 um, 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 song Scream is a brilliant fusion of the political and the intimate. Um, in this song, um, the bedroom is rendered um, uncomplicated by virtue of not being the streets on um, which black people are um, 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 killed. Um, so for Nur, black femme intimacy cannot be separated from what goes on in public and is in and of itself a form of protest and healing. And I'll, um, let me just play you a little clip. Do I have sound? It is complicated. But right now it's simple in my mind. Sheets and your skin, my focus is isolated. Let's lock this door from the inside. Nobody gon' tell me what to do when it comes to you. Just because they scared doesn't mean we scared to scream my name. The chorus of the song, Scream My Name Like a Protest, a protest makes this continuum um, palpable between the street and the bedroom. Um, because um, of the insistence that her lover say her name, um, echoing numerous R&B songs that um, deploy this particular trope, the most well-known one being, of course, Destiny's Child, Say My Name, but additionally, in the current political climate, um, that it makes reference to the hashtag Say Her Name and associated forms of activism that specifically address the many ways that black female persons, black femmes, are affected by state violence, which is usually rendered um, 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 invisible. Um, what new song does then is bring the street to the bedroom while at the same time draping the purportedly private and apolitical boudoir um, 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 sheets all over the um, street signs in your neighborhood. So that the rally serves not only to draw attention to the killing of specific black persons, um, <clears throat> But um, um, and, and to demand the abolition of the um, 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 police, but also about transfiguring the avenue into a series of possibilities for a different world in its relationship um, to the um, 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 bedroom. And I won't go into it, but of course um, there shouldn't be an, an underestimation here just how much neurologically music contributes to healing and repair, um, especially in the aftermath of um, um, trauma. 
Um, and just to um, wrap it up, among the many other things that the contemporary R&B music um, 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 teaches me is to remain vigilant about the deep entanglements between the interpersonal, affective, interior, intimate, and the capital P political, um, and that you know, change and revolution begin in one's um, surrounding. And um, they also, um, these currents in R&B, to summon Kara Keeling again, provide a black femme portal through which present impossibilities might appear in order to refigure future opacities at the crossroads of I can't breathe and waiting to exhale. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll now dedicate some time to a, a conversation that held between all of us. So I've prepared some questions for you. Uh, firstly, oftentimes alternative to the current order of things present themselves via different futurisms, as we've discussed. However, recognizing the incomplete nature of liberation projects, what strategies do we have to engage sciences to live through the here and now? So I open up that to any of you. Start? Okay. <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, I mean, I, I don't know, in so many ways, right? I mean, in terms of science, I was just actually saying this this morning, it's like, Science has bought us eugenics in the past couple, you know, in the past 150 years. Um, environmental racism, biological racism, it's, it's bought us phrenology. You know, so just this notion, um, the, the starting point that science knows everything and has everything figured out, I think is, is the first step in um, beginning to engage and, and start to break down the hold um, that science has. And, and science in so many ways, Again, it's, it, it gets the privilege of being seen as something that's objective and flat, and, um, and in that way, it, it, it has become a godlike thing. Like, you can't challenge it. Um, and, and, you know, God is, is supposed to be something that is ob objective, um, you know, and, and knows all. So science has positioned itself in, in this day as, as a kind of godlike body um, that can't be questioned. And I think um, when we begin to understand that we can question science because it does not have all the answers um, and because it has a particular bias that has um, created um, present circumstances of, of um, oppression and I'll even say genocide um, in, in particular communities, um, it, it, it bears um, questioning, it bears challenge. And so I think that's a starting point, at least for my work, is that um, it's okay. It's, I, I have to live with science, I get to question it. It's, it's scientific laws are no more um, set in stone, objective or, or apolitical than any other law, and I, and I treat it that way in, in my work, and as a lawyer, I, I understand the bounds in which I can manipulate the laws for my clients, and in which I can um, manipulate temporal systems embedded within the law and within particular legal systems on, on behalf of my clients, and, and can see the same way in, in kind of everyday life and, and the social application of science in, on my life and on my community and, and my environment. And so I start, I start at that point if that kind of answers the question. Mm -hmm. And I'll kind of follow up and say, like, one of my favorite ways to think about, or my favorite thing to think about science is, like, there, there was something before all of the things that we know as science. So, like, there was a thing before the periodic table, um, which is cute to think about now. There's this thing called phlog phlogiston, which is an element that is basically a bunch of tiny fires that make up one really big fire. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, like, so many beautiful ways to describe what fire is now, like, other than that, um, including, like, ouch, like, something that is hot, right, which is, you know, um, but when I think about that, now that there's a right answer to figure out what fire is, which is, like, which I don't actually know, it's, like, you know, chemicals that then rub together in friction and whatever, but um, <laughs> when I think about that, um, I really just remember that science almost seeks to pathologize, um, and to just make there a, a, like a right and a wrong answer. And this is one of the reasons why I look to like embodying, um, a type, it's like seeking sensation. So out of my, my practice, 
involves a lot of study of BDSM and sadomasochism. And I asked the question of like, well, what is, what is it like to inflict a science on the body, I guess, so that I can actually feel it? That's something real to me. Um, and I think that there's a lot of different um, ways to think about pain. Some pain is like not real, but a lot of not real pain is also pathologized by a medical community, which is also science. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about that, um, about science as, as more like methodologies and how can we re, repackage these methodologies as systems. And when we think about systems, it, it can apply to uh, conceptions of other sciences like time or like other things in, in, in across culture, across all different things, because we all have our own systems and systems don't seek to pathologize. So how can we, yeah, like repackage science to be a completely separate word or, or sort of a fractal tree of like another word. Yeah, I mean, um, just just to add to that, what I would say is to um, <laughs> not only to challenge science, right, and the biases, the violences that it inflicts, but also to think about all these other ways of producing, intuiting, imagining knowledge as forms of science, right? I mean, to me, Octavia Butler is among many, many other things. She's a scientist, right? And I would say that, you know, um, what some of the um, um, artists do with their voices and, 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 and the lyrics and, um, and, and just sort of imagination, that that's a form of um, um, science as, um, 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 as, as, as well, right? And I would, I would want us, you know, to uh, li literally listen more to those forms of um, science. And I think, Shawna, what you were talking about um, 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 as well, right? Right, that there, there are all these sort of established ways of knowing, sensing, feeling, et cetera, and, and, and so on, and not necessarily to make it more scientific in the traditional um, 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 Western sense, but um, to tap more into, um, um, in, into those things because they already um, exist, right? And um, while at the same time, um, challenging the um, um, the dominant um, um, Western scientific um, um, sci scientific um, 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 norms. So. Mm. Uh, thank you for that. So moving on, um, if science produces subjects as human or other, how does it existing outside of or in excess of the human category allow us to productively fail at being governable subjects, or in other words, in our survival? Have we made possible other ways of living differently? So I'm a puppy, like a human puppy. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shawnee, I'm a human puppy. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I feel like I really take this literally. In my practice, um, I have a series called The Chamber Series in which I have created a narrative with my practice of BDSM um, about a human puppy that is also a cyborg. Uh, and trying to conflate uh, sort of an animal consciousness with a physical body consciousness that is human with also a consciousness that is cyborg and really trying to focus on the consciousness as the subject itself, um, trying to escape I've lost my, I've lost your question. Um, no, that touches on it perfectly because in many ways, given our current crisis, we're sort of at a crossroads thinking what happens after human or after yeah. Anthropocene, so. Right, and puppy I guess. Puppy is one. <laughs> yeah, puppy is one. <laughs> I guess um, my argument there, like with this particular work that I do called the Chamber Series is that we're not really prepared to think sort of post quite yet, um, even though we really want to, there's so much work that we don't think about in terms of looking down upon a certain type of consciousness, especially within technology and the conversations within our AI, um, that we should do this work first. Um, and this is why I've assumed this human puppy position. <laughs> um, so I would say definitely yes. And I think um, the example that jumps to mind for me right now is color people's time as a active form of resistance against um, kind of, uh, again, the, the temporal, temporalizing, linear temporalization of, 
um, African enslaved um, um, folks who, who were um, forced over here. Um, colored people time um, is a hearkening back, I think, to a pre-linear um, ancestral um, way of, of, of experiencing time that is, um, has been patho pathologized um, in, in modern times, and it's seen as um, something that translates into black people have no concern for their future. Um, black people don't think about the future. Black people are unable to plan for the future because we're only concerned with the present. And this is used to justify medical um, things. So like when they're looking at, oh, well, why do people have, black people have high rates of diabetes? It's because they have no future, they, they live in a state of presentism. Um, and so again, we, we, time has been pathologized for us. And I think CP time is a, is a active form of resistance and not just form of resistance, but also just a, a a hearkening back to these kinds of things and CP time, right? It's the running joke that you know tell black people that an event starts an hour earlier because they're going to get there late, um, and that will get them there on time. And um, but you know when you when you kind of again go back and you're able to uncover um, that linear time and this 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 being on time to the minute is a very European Western um, way of, of dealing with time, you, you really, it really helps you to question this and to see CP time as more of a technology um, than anything else. Because um, when you, again, when you go back to look at these Afro diaspora traditions, showing up to an event late is, it means like that's when, when time starts, when you get there, when you all come together to start something, that's when time starts, not you know some preset date, calendar date that you then have to fill that container up it's it's something that's dynamic and that's that's co-created um, time so so I, I think that's one of the ways that we've we've formed a resistance um, people who are who were seen originally as being timeless and outside of time when come to find out everything they do is about time and it's about it's just a different form it's it's about observing the stars and using your environment and using your community to determine time and not some preset um, objective date that is predetermined Uh, thank you. Um, so moving on, um, related to that, I ask you, how can we expand what counts as science as well? How do we engage multiple knowledges to offer different ways of being in the world? I guess to, to echo what I said earlier and, and um, what my co-panelists um, just said, um, and I, I think the first step is to not only think of CP time, right, um, or the kind of scenario that, that you were um, that, that, that you were talking about, Shawnee, um, as um, only resisting something, right, but as also creating something um, else, right. And I do think that there are so many different ways in terms of family structures, community formation, um, dress, food, music, of course, etc., and so on. So many different ways in which all these other um, scientific um, 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 non-Western scientific um, forms of um, knowing, feeling, intuiting, reacting, et cetera, and so on, have been um, 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 created. And, um, and yeah, for us to um, begin to um, find languages to describe it and to uh, make it usable for the communities that, um, 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 that, that need it, right, without necessarily feeling the need to systematize it in, um, um, in, 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 in the way that it happens in, um, in, in Western scientific um, 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 discourse. And um, yeah, I guess my, my response to a lot of these things is just so much already exists, but oftentimes it's more about the, um, 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 the, the perspective and asking what can we do with it rather than saying that we actually need to um, create um, 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 things um, from scratch, which of course is also important. So. I think the, the hardest part about that is always just letting go of like a fear of messing it up or like what if other, someone else sees or, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's kind of one of those things you have to, if you, if you want to be about it, just go ahead and be about it. But even taking that first step I think is, always so hard because mm -hmm. to be able to escape science or escape like the method or the step or the pathway um, you have to deviate from it first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think realizing that 
you know, we get so caught up in what are we gonna do, just that like acceptance of when I do this, I will be outside for me is always mm -hmm. so hard. And then also when we get outside, I always, my fear is a, a kind of solipsism that is almost as sort of detrimental as the science itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so there becomes this push and pull of like what, you know, I, li I like what you said about you don't have to systematize everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I, I guess I'm speaking from my perspective as an artist. I, I, don't, I don't know any other any other way. Yeah, and, and I think of, oftentimes, um, just very briefly, that there is just this strong push to um, have it systema systematized or to have, for instance, with, with a lot of the, the, the discourses around Afro and other forms of futurism, is to have a concrete image of what that future is going to look like or what the alternative is going to look like. And for me, just wanting something else oftentimes is at the very least just as important because that's what moves things, right? Uh, to say, no, there has to be something else beyond what is being given to us and um, um, what, what, what is being imposed on us. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, we'll now move towards accepting some questions from the audience. So. Hi everyone, so folks are shy online, so we're gonna take questions from the audience. We'll have runners throughout, and please raise your hand, and uh, we'll take questions one at a time. And please feel free to send your questions at rtfq at ibeam.org. Thanks. Thank you, I liked, um, all of what, a lot of what you had to say. I'm just curious, where's the confrontation in any of this work? It feels like a very, um, it's a, a lot about study and maybe that's the relationship to the sciences, but I think there's the, the looming forces, the unspoken forces underneath this of patriarchy, racism, misogyny, transphobia, homophobia. Where's the confrontation in any of this? Is it, is it meant to be a confrontation? Are we post-confrontation? I'd like to hear more about that. Was that for a specific person? Or? I can go ahead and just speak. Uh, the confrontation in my practice, and especially in this piece, um, for, first of all, the quotes were from a, an article uh, from a magazine called Black Leather and Color, and the real Don Perry is trying to speak on the relationship between <coughs> race and sadomasochism, if the whole issue is dedicated to race play and specifically like white men playing with large muscular strong black men and fetishizing them. And um, the real Don Perry is saying that consent is like one of the most sort of like important things that you can give someone and that um, within these scenarios we have to give sort of our brothers and sisters credit enough to be able to consent to that and we have to respect those decisions. And within the community that's like a huge, huge, huge um, like state of argument constantly. Um, what can we consent to under a slave narrative? What can we consent to um, even outside those or with ourselves? Are we like sort of reenacting a bunch of oppression that we've sort of seeked so hard to like disengage from? Um, and that's something that every single time you go to enter into these mentalities that you kind of have to decide and whether that's a quick decision for you or not i think people have you know everyone's experience is very those conflicts um just kind of trickled down uh, because the taboo is so attached to um, what you're thinking and feeling just constantly in these spaces um i guess i don't really i'm not clear on the question but i feel like it's all confrontation for me especially as a black woman existing in these spaces, doing the work that I do, it's all confrontational. Um, particularly as an attorney, um, I, I am a practicing attorney. I represent low-income, mostly primarily black women um, who are at risk of um, or losing their house or homeless. Um, and it's confrontational every single moment that I walk into the courtroom. Um, I'm seen as the, the uh, I'm seen, as, I'm not seen legitimized in any way. I'm, I have natural hair. I, 
You know, I, I, I'm not legitimized in any way in that space, and it's confrontational every single moment of my life. Um, but I, I, I recognize my relative privilege um, to be able to go in there and, and advocate um, and advocate on behalf of, of someone who is not able to speak um, for themselves. And so, in that in that particular arena, um, so the confrontation is is in every iota of every piece of work that I do, um, and, and also as the mother of a um, trans, trans child, um, it, it's, it's, the confrontations are endless. I was a teen parent, so the confrontation there is endless. It's, it's all wrapped up in, and involved in the work. Um, so my, and my work is not academic, and, and I mean, but I think, um, I mean, I guess some people would see it as that, but I don't see it as that. I don't see myself as an academic. I, I, I've, I don't even think that I always have the language to, to be in that kind of space. Um, so I, I think the confrontation is, is in every part of it. Um, mm -hmm. No, I, I would definitely um, agree with that. And I think that the, um, the song that I was talking about, Scream My Name Like a Protest, it really highlights it. Like even in the space that's supposed to be hyper private where all those things are not supposed to matter, it's still there, right? Um, but that said, I also think that um, it is important to create these spaces that are not necessarily outwardly confrontational against those structures completely in order to have those spaces of retreat, of healing, um, of regeneration, et cetera, and, um, 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 and, 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 and so on, because I think they are just as important as the confrontational, the confrontational um, 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 aspect. Right, and I think that there there are also different ways beyond always clear confrontation and forced confrontation that one is positioned and can position oneself in relationship to those um, 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 to, to, to those structures. If that makes um, sense, that it doesn't always have to be about that clear confrontation. It might also mean is like what can I siphon off from the structure in order to create um, 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 a space that is more um, conducive to the communities that um, I represent, I want to represent, et cetera, and so on. So. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Anyone else? Hi. Um, I want to thank you guys all for doing this, you all for doing this. Um, you're speaking on a lot of issues that actually give me hope, hopefully maybe the rest of the audience too. Um, for a future that's ahead, or for the fact that you guys are diving into these issues. Um, I wanna know the future that you're imagining, if you could conjure an image that's built on these building blocks, um, what would it look like? Like the building blocks that you're laying, the research that you guys are doing, the everything. My future is here now. I, mean, it, like, I, I feel like the thing about a practice that meditates um, on power is always trying to find where that power is right now, all of a sudden, and whether that's to like take it, give it, exercise it, whatever it is. Um, and I work with technology in the same way because when we're talking about technology, um, sort of an, as it's understood across like a mass, we're kind of operating on a deficit a bit because not everyone has the latest technologies. I really actually try to not think about the future as much as possible so that I can have a common language between peoples, plural, um, and to think about a future feels exciting, um, but I let other people do that. Um, the futures, plural, that I imagine are quantum and um, nonlinear, and um, I think Einstein has done us a disservice in, in a sense of um, formalizing this um, notion that space and time are equivalent, because I don't find that in, in my experience. Um, and so a future that is not necessarily tied to spatiality in the sense that it is not one that is automatically deemed as in front of us and that we're moving towards on a linear line, um, linear arrow, because as I said, that that doesn't work for the major vast majority of people who are living on this <laughs> earth. Um, so I, I, I imagine futures that, again, are plural, quantum, feminine, womanist um, futures and um, that doesn't look like any particular thing like it's it certainly doesn't look like anything you would see in a sci-fi movie presently um, so and and the futures are communal 
Amen. <laughs> <laughs> to what both of you said. <laughs> well, um, thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. Thank you.